Okay, so uh, actually there was a, a slight change, I think, from the schedule. Since I'm giving the first talk, uh, we decided not to put the error correction part in Dave's talk, which would be third. So instead I'll be giving the introduction to error correction and fault tolerance. Um, so uh, here is kind of a, a map of the, the area that we'll be talking about in this conference. Um, down here in the, in the lower left corner, you can see the, the classical world that we're familiar with, uh, with skyscrapers and satellite dishes and stuff like that. Um, and then the upper part of the slide is the quantum world, right? And, and in the quantum world is where, you know, you have quantum computation, quantum cryptography, quantum communications, all that stuff that we're, we're familiar with from all the other work on, on quantum information. But the problem is that that quantum world up at the top is separated from this classical world by this vast desert of decoherence. And anything that tries to cross from the quantum world into the classical world is decohered and it becomes just, you know, boring classical stuff. Ah, uh, thanks. Um, so uh, the, the goal, of course, of quantum error correction is to build a protective wall around the quantum world to prevent the, uh, the uh, corrosive effects of these desert sands from creeping into the quantum world and destroying the, all the interesting quantum phenomena that can be found there. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do today is give you a very quick tour of this land of quantum error correction. And because I only have 55 minutes, it's going to have to be, I'm afraid, a, a rather quick tour. Um, but uh, we can at least hit on most of the high points that, that you see pictured in this slide. Um, so anyway, so the basic idea, of course, of quantum error correction is you have some, some source of qubits, which we can imagine is coming from some pure mountain spring up here. And then they, you know, they, they fall down a waterfall and into this river and flow through the land of, of quantum error correction. But of course, when entering the world, they're no longer such a pure mountain water. They acquire some, some dirt and some junk in them, which you probably can't really see, but are depicted by little green uh, dots here. And in any case, the, the goal then of quantum error correction is to purify those waters and get another nice pure stream that can flow into the rest of the, the quantum world and provide uh, fuel and, and material for the quantum algorithms, quantum protocols that we'd like to run. Okay, so uh, to start, let's talk about quantum error correction. And then we'll get to quantum fault tolerance in, in just a little bit. So quantum error correction, of course, we're, we're going to imagine that the gates that we're performing, the quantum gates, are perfect things. And that all we want to do is, say, transmit a qubit from Alice to Bob, or multiple qubits, of course. Uh, now, you can also imagine that this is just not a, a transmission over communications line, but just storage and time. So Alice prepares a quantum state, and then sometime later she wants to retrieve it. But of course, in the, in the meantime, there's been noise, or in the communications channel, there's been noise. And uh, the, the noise in this case, since the, the qubit is only interacting once with the environment, we can imagine as a super operator. So the environment comes in some arbitrary quantum state that's uncorrelated with Alice's state. And it interacts through some unitary interaction with the, the qubit being transmitted. And then some qubits are discarded. And the overall result is that if Alice starts with a density matrix rho, then Bob receives the density matrix sum over k, a k rho, a k dagger. And, uh, you know, there's some condition on these. The sum of a k dagger, a k has to equal 1, and the a k's have to be positive. But other than that, this is the most general quantum operation. Again, provided the environment is not originally entangled with the state. Now, I should say, we're not restricting the case to Alice having just her own state. It might be part of an entangled state that's correlated with something else, which I haven't drawn here. And we'd like, when Bob recovers it, to not just be able to, to decode and get back the state rho, but to preserve any entanglement that that state rho had with the, the stored outside state. That, that, again, is not depicted here. Um, but, of course, we haven't gotten to that yet. This is just what the error does. And, of course, then when we talk about fault tolerance, we'll also have to add in the fact that gates can have errors and the qubit can interact multiple times with the same environment and things like that. So I'll, I'll d discuss that later. Um, so, okay, but anyway, let's, let's focus on the types of errors here. Well, there's lots and lots of things that can happen, of course. But here are some simple examples. So let's, in fact, just think about some examples that can happen to a single qubit. So, for instance, we could have a bit flip. And if you're thinking about classical error correcting codes, that's kind of the main thing that you have to worry about, right? Flipping a bit from 0 to 1 and from 1 to 0. So in the quantum language, we'll represent by the, that by matrix uh, represented by x, okay? But of course, since this is a quantum state, we also have to worry about what happens to superpositions, and we have to worry about phases. And in fact, we could have a phase flip error that takes 0 to 0, 
and 1 to minus 1. Okay? Um, but there's more than that, right? These are, so these are both unitary operations. We have to worry about non-unitary operations that interact with the environment and then discard some qubits. So for instance, we could have uh, uh, something where the environment is just a random bit, 0, 1. And if it's a 0, it does nothing. If it's a 1, it does a phase flip on the qubit that we're storing. So that can be represented by this, this map. Rho goes to rho plus z rho z dagger over 2. Okay, so half the time it stays rho, half the time it goes to, to z rho z dagger. And what this does is it totally destroys any phase between the zero and the one state. So if you start with some arbitrary superposition of zero and one, you instead end up with a mixture of zero and one. And you no longer have a superposition, it's basically just a classical random bit. Okay, so this is decoherence. Um, and of course, this is something that's very, very common in the real world, and so it's something we're going to definitely have to deal with with quantum error correction. Um, but then there's lots of other things. So, for instance, you could imagine rotation by some angle theta, and this is going to be a phase rotation, and zero goes to zero, and one then is going to, going to go to e to the two uh, i two theta one, and I, the factor of two is just some stupid conventional thing, depending on how you define things. Um, Okay, so these, of course, are not the full list of possible errors, but they give you a good idea of the spectrum of things that can happen to a single qubit. And of course, when you have multiple qubits, you have many more possibilities. So somehow, we're going to have to be able to design quantum error correcting codes that are going to be able to correct for all of these things. But of course, if there's just a totally general error, and you have an n qubit state coming in here, and then a totally random n qubit state coming out here, well, there's not a lot we can do about that. Um, so we're going to make some kind of assumption, and the usual assumption for quantum error correction is that the errors are weak. And frequently we're even assuming further than that, that they're, they're weak and, and acting separately on individual qubits. And in that case, it tends to be a pretty good approximation to assume that um, at most t qubits have gone wrong. And when we do that, we're going to assume that they go wrong in some arbitrary way, but that there's never more than t qubits that are wrong. Okay? So we're going to focus on t-qubit errors and try to correct that. And of course, in a more realistic channel, where each qubit is going wrong separately with some prob small probability, that's not going to be exactly the same. But it will have a very high fidelity, right? Because if the error rate is small enough, well, say it's probability p on a single qubit, so then the probability of errors on two qubits is order p squared, and on three qubits is order p cubed, and so on. And so there's some combinatoric factor due to the fact that there's you know, many sets of two qubits or three qubits. But if the error rate is small enough, it'll overcome that. And, uh, and at very small error rates, we get very high fidelity to this t-qubit error model. Okay? So that's what we're going to talk about when we're talking about quantum error correcting codes. Codes that correct t errors and no more. Okay, so um, when we design a quantum error correcting code, it's nice to you know, be able to say, well, here's a, a candidate code. Does it work or not? And so uh, people have developed a quantum error correction conditions that allow us to test that. So uh, in particular, if uh, psi i are the, the basis states for this quantum, the subspace that's the quantum code, and the EAs run over all possible errors, it should be true that psi i EA dagger EB psi j is equal to CAB times delta ij. So what does this mean? Well, there's a couple of things that are important about this. So the first one is that if i is not equal to j, um, this is orthogonal. Okay, so even, th so that what that means is that the error EB acting on psi j always gives you some state that's distinguishable from EA acting on psi i. Which means that states psi i and psi j, which start out orthogonal, will always stay orthogonal no matter what. Okay, even if they have different possible errors acting on them. Okay, that's very important because if they ever become non-orthogonal, then we have no way of distinguishing them and we won't be able to recover the original state. Um, so the other thing is that uh, this matrix CAB doesn't, it depends on, on which errors you have, EA and EB, but it doesn't dis depend on I and J. Okay? And basically what that says is that we can learn about the errors and find out which error we had without learning anything about the quantum state. That's incredibly important, of course, and classically we wouldn't have to worry about that. It doesn't matter if we learn about the encoded data. But in the quantum case, we want to deal with superpositions, right? And if we were to learn 
So well, suppose we had the state psi i plus psi j encoded, and we were to learn whether we had psi i or psi j, we destroy that superposition, right? And since superposition is what makes quantum computing special and what makes it different from classical computing, that would be really bad. We'd, we'd ruin the whole point of doing this, okay? So uh, in particular, it's, it's helpful to think of the case where CAB is delta AB. So in that case, different errors are also, also orthogonal spaces. And unfortunately, I can't, it's a four-dimensional thing just to take the smallest example, but I've tried to draw it anyway. Um, and here we have a, a two-dimensional plane. So this, is, this plane is the code space and has, so has a zero and a one in it, encoded zero and an encoded one. And then we have some orthogonal subspace, which again has an encoded zero and an encoded one, and that represents the error EA. And each separate error, in the case where CAB equals delta AB, each separate error gives you another orthogonal plane. And the important thing here is that each plane is perpendicular to the other planes. So that means there's some projective measurement we can make that tells us which plane we're in. It doesn't tell us where within that plane we are, right? Because that would again tell us about what the encoded state was. But it tells us which plane we have. And then we can map, do some unitary map that will, once we know which plane it is, we can do some unitary map that maps this plane back to the original code space, thereby correcting the error. Um, so uh, another thing that's, that's worth noting about this is that CAB does not have to be equal to delta AB. And this is another source of a big difference from classical coding theory. Because in particular, you get cases where CAB does not have maximum rank. And what does that mean? That means that there are different errors that have linearly dependent actions on the encoded states. So for instance, there's two errors that do the same thing to the encoded state. Classically, this doesn't happen. But quantum mechanically, it does, and it makes it much harder, for instance, to set upper bounds on the, the behavior of quantum codes, the performance of quantum codes, than, you do, than, is, than is true in the classical case. Um, and so if we have this case where the rank is less than maximum, we call it a degenerate code. And otherwise, it's a non-degenerate code. I guess I should say, of course, you can always, oh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. So, um, so uh, the, the, another nice feature of these quantum error correction conditions, if you go through them, you'll find that you have a lot of choice as to which errors EA you can pick to be your basis errors here. So here I had said you had just some set of errors E. And now I'll point out that if two errors EA and EB are in that set, then it's also true, those quantum error correction conditions will also be true if you include the error, right, let's see, I guess here I called them A and B. If you also include the error alpha A plus beta B. So if you have two errors that you can correct, you can also correct any linear combination of those two errors. Okay? And basically this follows from the linearity of quantum mechanics. If we have some superposition of two errors that acts on the state, and then we make a measurement that tells us about the error, it'll collapse into either the error A or the error B. And once it's collapsed, then we can just treat it that way and correct it as if it were always just the error A or just the error B. And, and the way quantum mechanics works, that'll be just fine. Okay? So by treating it as if it were one of these base errors, we kind of make that, that wish come true. Um, so anyway, so uh, what this means is that we have a lot of freedom for how we choose the errors. We only need to choose a basis of errors, and then everything else will fall automatically in the quantum error correcting code. And that has a very nice additional benefit because it means that we can also correct all kinds of decoherent errors that act um, kind of within the same basis. So in particular, if we have uh, an error that, that takes rho to sum of ak rho ak dagger, and all the ak's that appear in this expansion can be written as a sum of errors that we included in our original set E, then it also follows automatically that we can correct those things. Okay? So in particular, if we're only interested in single qubit errors, so that was the case of T equals one, then um, it's enough to consider just four possible errors, I, X, Y, and Z. Okay? Uh, I guess I showed you X and Z before. Y is basically, what is, it? is I, X times Z, so it's both a bit flip and a phase flip simultaneously. X, remember, is the bit flip, Z is the phase flip. And then I is the identity. Well, we have to include that for this theorem, because otherwise we don't have the basis of, of two by two matrices, but it's also uh, kind of important for conceptual reasons, right? Because it would be kind of embarrassing if we designed this elaborate quantum error correcting code and then there was no error, the identity happened, and we didn't know how to correct that. Okay, so we'd like to throw in the identity here. 
even though it's you know, not really an error. But we do need it because if we write any two by two matrix, we have to write it as a sum of these four things. Um, so if you do that, if you can correct i, x, y, and z on every single qubit in the, in the code, then you can correct any single qubit error that occurs, compatible with quantum mechanics. OK, so uh, now a little bit of notation. Um, we say that if we have a, some poly error, oh, sorry, sorry, we so define the poly group as tensor products of i, x, y, and z. And in order to make it a group closed on the multiplication, we have to throw in phases, plus or minus 1, plus or minus i. And then we say that the weight of a poly error is just the number of qubits on which it acts, not as the identity. Okay? Um, okay, and then uh, similarly, the i, x, y, and z span the space of two by two matrices, and the weight t poly errors span the space of all t qubit errors. So this includes any two to the t by two to the t matrix acting on just t qubits, but it also includes superposition of things acting on different sets of qubits, in fact. Usually we don't have to worry about that, but this is the most general case of t qubit errors. And so uh, uh, a quantum error correcting code which corrects all weight t poly errors, therefore corrects all t qubit errors. So a lot of times it just makes sense to forget about other kinds of errors and just think about poly errors. And if we want to correct t errors, we just have to worry about the weight t polys. Okay, so moving on, it's nice to have a mathematical formalism which will let us deal with these codes more easily. And so then there's a stabilizer code formalism, which actually incorporates most of the quantum error correcting codes known. Not all. There's some interesting ones that are not stabilizer codes. But it, it does incorporate quite a lot of them. So, uh, okay, so the idea of the stabilizer code is that we work on this mathematical structure of the poly group and uh, start to, to, to find very interesting properties come out of it. So uh, one interesting fact about the polys is that pairs of them either commute or anti-commute. But to, to define a stabilizer code, we're going to define a group of things that all commute with each other. It's an abelian subgroup of the poly group. And um, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to define the code to be the plus one eigenspace of this abelian subgroup. So uh, we should make sure that's an abelian subgroup that doesn't contain minus one, right? Because minus one obviously doesn't have any, any plus one eigenvalues. So then we have a theorem. So, uh, uh, the, the, if you have a stabilizer code that has a stabilizer S with R generators and it's acting on N qubits, well, each generator kind of has a plus one eigenspace and a minus one eigenspace. So it kind of divides the whole system in half, getting rid of one qubit. And so at the end, we have K uh, encoded qubits, which is equal to N minus R. So we started with N qubits, we had put on R constraints and we're left with N minus R logical qubits or encoded qubits. Okay, and so that's a nice fact about stabilizers. We can just look at it and see how many encoded qubits we have. But of course, the real thing we're interested in is how many errors we can correct. So that's only slightly more difficult. So to do that, we look at the set N of S. So N of S is the normalizer, or in this case, the commutator, they're, they're equal, of the stabilizer S inside the poly group. So it's defined as the set of polys P for which PM is equal to MP for all M and S. Okay, so the set of things that commute with everything in the stabilizer. So those errors will not be detectable by our quantum error correcting code. If we were to apply that to an encoded state, we'll get another encoded state. Um, however, it's not always a different encoded state, right? Because the stabilizer is an abelian subgroup, right? So anything in the stabilizer commutes with everything in the stabilizer, and therefore S is a subset of N of S. But things in the stabilizer, well, the code words are plus one eigenvalues of, those, of all of those operators. So if we apply something in the stabilizer, we get back the same state. So that's not an error. That's doing nothing, right? That's just acting like the identity on the code space. And therefore, the set of undetectable errors is n of s minus s. And so based on that, we define the distance of a code to be the, um, the minimum weight of an element n of s minus s. And the distance then has some connection back to these quantum error correction conditions that I showed you a couple of slides ago. And in fact, we can correct uh, a t qubit error so long as t is less than d minus 1 over 2. Less than or equal to, I should say, d minus 1 over 2. Okay? So in particular, if we want to correct single qubit errors, we need a distance 3 code. Right? And that makes sense because if we have um, 
n qubits here, and we have one error here and one error here, that could give us a detectable error, right? We should be able to distinguish between error here and error here. And so that's a wait two thing. So if we have a distance three code where we can detect anything up to wait two, that'll allow us correct anything up to wait one. Oh, and some more notations. So uh, n, we, we put these in this, these square double brackets. We say that n is the number of qubits in the code, physical qubits, k is the number of logical qubits, and then d is the distance of the code. Okay. So when we're designing a quantum error correcting code, there's really a lot of properties that we like to have. And of course, ideally we'd like to have a single code that's good for all of these properties. But realistically, there's some trade-off between them. But frequently we can design codes that are good for many of these at once. So of course the most obvious thing is that we want a high rate, right? We want to correct lots of errors and we want to encode lots of qubits. But of course we should measure this relative to the total number of physical qubits that we're using. So we should have a high ratio of k over n and a high ratio of d over n. Okay? Of course both of them have to be less than or equal to 1. It turns out that in quantum error correcting codes, d over n actually has to be less than or equal to a half, roughly. Um, so another property that we'd like to have is not just good enough to have a high rate, but we'd like to be able to efficiently figure out what error occurred. Actually, in general, this is a very hard problem, even for the restricted class of stabilizer codes. Finding the, 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 the appropriate error as a function of the, the thing that you measure, the error syndrome, can, is in fact an NP-complete problem. Um, but uh, there are some codes for which it's a very efficient thing to do, that you can do it in, in even in some cases in linear time in the size of the code. Okay? So ideally we'd like to have a code that has high rate and has an efficient decoding algorithm. And that's, I mean, there's, there's some work on that and, and maybe we'll hear about it later in this conference. Um, okay, what else? Well, uh, maybe we don't want to deal with this t-qubit error model. Maybe we want to deal with some more restricted error model. And the reason for doing that is that if you have more information about the errors, you might expect to be able to get a higher rate, a more efficient code. And in some cases, you can do that. Um, so what else? Well, frequently it's helpful to have a code that's very symmetrical in, in certain ways. Um, and one reason for that is that fault-tolerant operations uh, come out frequently of the symmetries of the code. So a code that has a lot of symmetries has a lot of easy fault-tolerant operations that you can perform on it. Um, and sometimes, you know, these quantum error correcting codes are useful for other, other kinds of interesting quantum states and quantum constructions like that, and having a lot of symmetries can help in that too. Um, and then, you know, sometimes there's other application-specific properties. Like for fault tolerance, it's useful to have a code where you can just measure a few qubits at a time to figure out what the error is, because each qubit that you measure is introducing extra errors. Um, and, and you can imagine other kinds of, of such applications that, that require different kinds of codes. Okay, so let's see some examples of codes. So first, this is the smallest code that's known because it's the smallest code that exists that corrects one error. So it's a five qubit code. Um, so, uh, so here's the stabilizer of the five qubit code. So, so here's the four generators. One, uh, sorry. One, two, three, four. And of course, five physical qubits minus four generators is one encoded qubit that comes out of the theorem I showed you before. And if you, if you go through it, you can find out that the distance of this code is three. So it corrects one general error. Um, so I guess let's, let's do just a couple of examples of that. So what that means in practice is that if you have some general error and you measure the eigenvalue of these four generators as a stabilizer, that'll tell you what the error is. Okay, general single qubit error. And the reason it is is because an error will cause, will flip the, the phase of an eigenvalue from plus one to minus one if and only if the error anti-commutes with that generator of the stabilizer. So for instance, if you have the error x on the first qubit, well that'll commute with the first generator and the second generator and the third generator because x commutes with x and commutes with i, of course. But x anti-commutes with z. So if you, to, if you had the error x on the first qubit and you measured these four eigenvalues, well, for the original state, we had plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. But after the Rx, we have plus one, plus one, plus one, minus one. And so we could write that down as zero, 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 one to see that which eigenvalue has flipped. And that is a, a something that uniquely identifies that the first qubit underwent a bit flip error. And if we had a different error, say y on the third qubit, we'll have a different sequence of eigenvalues. 
In this case, we have a unique error string from for each error. This is a non-degenerate code. And so, for instance, y anti-commutes with the first three generators and commutes with the third one, or with, sorry, with the fourth one. And so we have the error syndrome 1110. And if you go through, well, there's five qubits. X, Y, Z could occur to each one, so that's 15, plus the identity is 16 possible errors. And there's two to the fourth possible error syndromes, and each one corresponds to one of those 16 errors. So that gives you some idea of why this is the smallest quantum error correcting code. But of course, there could have been a degenerate code. There isn't. But there could have been a degenerate code that's smaller, so that's not a proof. Okay, moving on. Um, let's go to the seven qubit code. So the seven qubit code um, also is a stabilizer code, but it's part of another general class of codes called CSS codes, after the inventors Calderbank, Shore, and Steen. And the idea here is we're going to take advantage of classical coding theory. We're going to take, in fact, two classical codes, C1 and C2, although in this case they're the same code. And classical linear codes are defined in terms of a parity check matrix. So if you don't know what it is, that is, don't worry about it too much. If you do know, the way you get the quantum code out of that is you take the parity check matrix of C1 and convert all the ones into Zs. And this part will detect bit flip errors and correct bit flip errors, just the same way that the classical code originally did. And then for C2, we take the parity check matrix and convert the ones in that into Xs. And that gives us another set of generators. And those will detect and correct phase errors. Okay? So we can detect bit flip errors, X is up here, phase errors, Z, Z's down here, and then if we have a Y, that's both an X and a Z, so it'll show up on both parts. Okay? And since this quantum error, this, this classical error correcting code could correct up, in this particular case, it could correct up to one bit flip error, and this code C2 could correct up to one error classically, it corrects now one phase error. So now we can correct one general error, any arbitrary single qubit error. Okay? And so this is a 713 quantum error correcting code. It has one encoded qubit because we have six generators here and seven physical qubits. And then if you write them out, the code words, so this is the logical zero and this is the logical one. Um, and so these things are superpositions over subcodes of the classical code. So every, every one of the states that appears in the superposition is actually a classical code word for the, the seven bit Hamming code but only half of them appear in the logical zero and half appear in the logical one. Okay, so uh, now it's time to move on to fault tolerance. So now we have this spectrum of quantum error correcting codes, but we'd like to consider what happens if we, we again, not in this channel model where just one error occurs at one time, but where the, every single gate that we do has some error in it, or at least has the potential for error in it. So one of the main things that we're gonna have to deal with in talking about quantum fault tolerance is the idea of error propagation. Because errors, even if the gates are perfect, once we have an error, the error doesn't stay put. It'll move around in the code according to how we do gates. So for instance, imagine this case. Um, suppose we have a controlled not gate from between two qubits. And they're supposed to both be zero. Well, of course, if we do the controlled not, they both come out zero. But suppose there's been a bit flip error. So this first qubit is one instead of zero. Well, then once we do the control not gate, both of these output qubits are one, right? Because the second qubit gets flipped when it's not supposed to. So instead of having just an error on the first qubit, now we have an error on both qubits. Okay? In other words, the bit flip error has propagated forward from the control of the C0 to the target of the C0. So classically, that's all you'd have to worry about with a control not, but quantumly, there's something more that can happen. Phase errors can go the other way. So to see that, let's look at this example, where both initial qubits are supposed to be zero plus one. So 0 plus 1, if you flip it, stays 0 plus 1. So the output of this will again be 0 plus 1 tensor 0 plus 1. But if we had 0 minus 1 down here, then whenever you flip the second qubit, we'll get a phase of minus 1. So if we just had a single qubit in isolation, that wouldn't matter. But because we have two qubits here, and this not only appears when this is a 1, if this is a 0, we get no phase. But if this is a 1, we're going to get a phase of minus 1. So what we get out here is not 0 plus 1 tends to 0 minus 1, but 0 minus 1 tends to 0 minus 1. So instead of having a phase error just on the second qubit, we have phase errors on both qubits. So phase errors have propagated backwards from the target of the control knot to the control. So in the quantum case, there's, I mean, there is a distinction, of course, between the control and target, but, but errors can propagate either direction. Okay, so both qubits are affecting the other one. So whenever we do a gate between two qubits, even if it's a perfect gate, but we had an error pre-existing in the code, that error will spread along the, the, the path of the gate. 
So we're going to have to be very careful when we design these fault tolerant circuits to avoid that. And of course, even worse than that, because the gates might not be correct themselves. The gates might be introducing new errors. Okay? And when we have a gate that's interacting two qubits, well, even just a single fault somewhere in that gate could make both qubits go wrong. Okay? So when we design our quantum fault tolerant protocols, we're going to have to be very careful so that if there's one gate that's wrong somewhere in the circuit, it's only going to cause one error somewhere in a block. Now, of course, we can't ensure that it only causes one qubit to go wrong, because if the gate is interacting two qubits, then it's already two qubits that could go wrong right away. But what we can do is we can isolate those qubits from each other. So for instance, if we're using the seven qubit code, which happens to be very good for fault tolerance, we'll have one error in one block of the seven qubit code and one error in another block of the seven qubit code. So how do we arrange that? Well, in general, we're going to arrange that by using transversal operations. So the idea of a transversal operation is that we interact only the i qubit of one block of the code with the i qubit of another block. So for instance, here, if we have two blocks of the seven qubit code, we can do control knots from the first qubit to the first qubit, the second qubit of the first block to the second qubit of the second block, and so on. Okay? And look what happens then. So if one of these gates goes wrong, well, then we'll have one error up here and one error down here. Or if there was an error up here and we did a control knot between the two, that error might propagate down here. But that's okay, because each of these blocks can correct one error. So one error in each block, that's okay. What would be bad is if we had a control knot, say, from here to here, within the same block. And that could cause two errors in the same block. And we don't know how to correct that using the seven qubit code. It only has distance three. Okay? So if possible, we'd like to design all our fault tolerant gates to be transversal operations. And in fact, for the seven qubit code, we can do lots and lots of gates transversally. We can do, for instance, the control not gate, in kind of the way I said, Hadamard. So that's transversal just by doing a single qubit Hadamard in each of the seven qubits in the block. And say the pi over four rotation. So that's the diagonal gate that does zero to zero and one to i times one. And of course, any product of these we can also do with a, a, a transversal gate just by doing the appropriate product of these logical operations. Okay, so that's a bunch of gates. And those gates generate something called the Clifford group. The Clifford group is, is kind of important in coding theory because it has a, a very close relation to the Pauli group. It's the normalizer of the Pauli group and the unitary group. And uh, has a close relation to the structure of stabilizer codes, therefore, and is, is useful, as you see, for, for talking about fault tolerant operations. However, it turns out that the Clifford group is not universal for quantum computation. Worse than that, it can actually be simulated classically in time n squared or n cubed. Um, but, uh, so that means that it's not, it's not really useful if that's the only thing we can do with fault tolerant operations, right? Because if we can simulate it classically, what was the whole point of building a quantum computer? Um, but uh, luckily, there's, there's other things that we can do to, to, to kind of go the rest of the way, given these few sets of gates that we can do transversally. We can supplement that and get a full fault tolerant protocol. So the way we do that is we basically use ancilla states. So ancilla states are extra states that we, we construct, sometimes with great effort. And then we interact them with the data that's encoded using this quantum error correcting code, and somehow perform other kinds of gates or operations on them. So for instance, if we're doing quantum error correction, we have to involve some of these special ancilla states, if we want to do it fault tolerantly, at least. And if we want to do uh, the rest of the universal set of gates, so in fact, the Clifford group plus any other gate is sufficient. But to get one of those other gates, we again need some special ancilla state. Um, and so I won't go through these constructions in detail. There's not enough time. But uh, the basic idea is, is, is frequently it, it follows this, this kind of outline. So we're going to do some kind of non-fault tolerant thing to create this ancilla state. And frequently, it's actually going to be a state that's encoded using the same code. But it might not, if it's, since it's a non-fault tolerant construction method, the state we get might not be the correct encoded state. So what we have to do is we have to check it somehow. And so there's a lot of ways of checking these things, depending on the precise ancilla that we want to create. And we have an advantage here, because we know what ancilla we want to create. Whereas the data might be halfway through some big computation, we don't know exactly what state it's supposed to be in. But the ancilla is a very specific state, so we, we know what it's supposed to be and we can check that. Not arbitrary ancillas, but the ancillas that we need for fault tolerance, at least we know how to check. Um, and once we've done that, we, we interact it with the data, and 
that will perform the gate we want to do or do error correction or, or whatever we're trying to do at this point. And frequently this interaction is some variant of teleportation. Okay? Frequently, given the Clifford group, that's really enough to do quantum teleportation. And so, so, so we can then leverage the fact that we can do the transversal Clifford gates on the seven qubit code to perform any universal operation. Okay, so uh, moving on. Um, now we have a fault tolerant protocol. I haven't, you know, of course, gone through the details of the circuitry, but the basic idea is given a, a quantum computer whose individual gates are pretty good, we can make an encoded computer that acts with encoded states where the logical operations are more reliable than the physical operations. Okay? But that's just a little bit more reliable. And really, we'd like to be a lot more reliable. But we say, well, okay, if we can improve it once by encoding it using this fault tolerant protocol, why not encode it again and make it even better? And in fact, that's a very good thing to do. So what we do is use something called concatenated coding, where we take one qubit encoded in n qubits using our regular quantum error correcting code. In this case, I've used n equals three because you know I need enough space on the slide to draw it. But of course, three qubits is not enough to, to make a real quantum error correcting code capable of correcting a general error at least. Um, and then you take each of these n qubits and encode it again using the same code or a different code if you like. And so now we have n squared qubits. And if that's not enough, you can take each of these and encode it again using n cubed qubits. Of course, as you see, the number of qubits is increasing pretty fast. If we start with seven, then encode it in, in two levels, we have 49. And then another level with seven cubes, which I guess is 343 qubits. So pretty soon we have lots and lots of qubits. But luckily, the error rate is also improving very quickly. So I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but basically, the idea is each time we add a level of concatenation, instead of having an error rate of p, well, if it's a code that corrects one error, then in order to, to get a problem, we need two errors to occur in a short time before we've done error correction. And so the error rate is going to be order p squared. But of course, there's also some constant factor because there's lots of gates that we had to do to do error correction and to do this transversal gate or whatever kind of gate we're doing. So the error rate is some constant times p squared. But if p is small enough, the c p squared is smaller than p. And then every time we add a level of concatenation, the error rate is going to go down. And in fact, it can go down arbitrarily because we have this threshold theorem, which says that if the error rate is below some threshold value, p sub t, then uh, we can do arbitrarily long quantum computations with relatively modest overhead. So let's go through that argument just a little more carefully. This is not a complete proof. There are some details that need to be worked out. But this is the main idea. Um, so going back, remember we said that p goes to c times p squared. So let's rewrite, rewrite that. You notice that if c times p is less than 1, that that's the condition for this c p squared to be less than p. So let's write, rewrite c as 1 over p sub t. And uh, what we do is we find that, um, so p goes to p sub t times p over p sub t squared. So if we do that once, that's an improvement. If we do it again, well now it's going to be p over p sub t to the fourth. And if we do it again, it's p over p sub t to the eighth. And every time we do that, we square it again. Okay? So if we do k levels of concatenation, we find that the logical error rate after k levels, p sub k, is equal to, or less than or equal to, p sub t times p over p sub t to the 2 to the k. Okay? So the error rate is going down double exponentially in the number of levels. And that's a good thing because the number of qubits we needed was going up exponentially. But compared to a double exponential, an exponential is nothing. Okay? So the upshot is that to, to get a desired error rate, say 1 over t, so if we have t, a computation of length t, we'd like the error rate per logical gate to be about 1 over t. And so we need log log t, log log 1 over t, levels of concatenation to do that. And then the number of qubits we need is exponential in log log t, which is then a poly polynomial in the logarithm of t. Okay? So if we want to do a really, really long computation, we luckily don't need that many extra qubits to do this concatenated co coding and get the error rate down to the, to the desired level of accuracy. Okay? Okay. Um, so, uh, of course, there have to be some assumptions behind this theorem. Um, 
So I've given you some, some kind of indication of how it works, but, oh, yeah, sorry. So one of the, one of the things, uh, before, I, before I do that, I just want to point out that we are assuming that errors can occur in any part of this computer, okay? So the main, the components that we need to, to perform a quantum computation, we need to prepare states, you know, inject physical zero qubits, say, into this computation. There can be errors in that. There can be errors in the gates that we perform. If we have a qubit that's sitting around not doing anything, there can be an error then. And of course, when we measure at the end or in the middle of the computation, there can be errors in those measurements too, okay? So all of those things can be, can be wrong. Um, but uh, there's, of course, other, other physical requirements.